let's go to Michael Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, here at Staples Center, Los Angeles, we go to the Budweiser scorecards. Lou Filippo scores the bout, 116-112. He has it for Mosley. Marley Salmon scores it, 115-113. to 113. He has it for De La Hoya. Pat Russell scores it, 115 to 113 for the winner by split decision. And new welterweight champion of the world, Sugar Shay Hello Boxing Asylum listeners, it's Steve Wellings here and welcome to the inaugural episode of Punches from the Past where members of the Boxing Asylum Nuthouse podcast go through fights from uh, years gone by and just discuss how we thought it went before, during and after the fight. Tonight's um, bout that we're going to be looking at, myself, Andy Patterson, David Lee and Mr Kurt Ward, is going to be Destiny from June the 17th, the year 2000. Uh, the fight between Oscar De La Hoya and Sugar Shane Mosley that took part in the Staples Centre, Los Angeles. Obviously, um, not really much controversy in this one, but Sugar Shane coming out with the victory. I'm going to hand over to Andy first, uh, just to pretty much get us started off and tell us, uh, pre-fight really, Andy, what you thought about this fight before we open it up to the panel. Um, well, pre-fight, obviously, I think there was a... Uh, you know, obviously these two lads being from, from the LA area and stuff, you know, the... Um, the chances of getting that fight in LA at the time was, was pretty hard going because uh, basically because of the tax, you know, the state tax, I think the Stunman block at the time was a 5% tax on boxing and wrestling shows and uh, obviously the Staples, you know, Staples Centre was going to sell out for the fight and it would generate something like 8 million, I think uh, it would basically mean a, a tax bill of 400,000 on that fight, so and there was also a 3% tax to the, to the city of LA which was I think it was an extra 240,000 or something, so I think the, the, the real stumbling block behind the fight to kind of start off with really was, uh, as I say, is trying to get the kind of the tax down. I think they did manage to get a, a kind of cap on it at 50,000 at the state tax. And uh, basically, I think there's it says that the fight went on to generate something like 8 million at the, at the gate. Big fight. Um, I think it was, was it for the lineal title, I think it was. Yeah, huge purses as well, Andy. 15 mil for De La Hoya and I think about 4.5 or 5 for Mosley. Yeah, career high payday, which you think about it as well. Going into that fight, Mosley himself, um, I, th I think, well, I, I would probably say the main question behind Mosley was it's just his lack of game, you know, big game experience, basically, or you know, big fight experience. I think, you know, at the time, his, his best win was probably Jesse James Leha, maybe John John Molina, and uh, what do you call him? Guy Rivera. Is it Rivera? Yeah. Rivera, I think he went, did he know fight with uh, Penel Whitaker as well? Should have got, if it is him, I think he should have got the, the decision against them actually. But yeah, um, so the, the, the main thing about the fight really was the fact is that Mosley wasn't really kind of you know seasoned, I suppose, in the big fights where Oscar was actually coming up through the ranks, beating just about everybody. Chavez, 
Gennaro Hernandez, Leha himself, obviously. He did get lucky, I suppose, going into the fight. He uh, beat Ike Corte in a split decision victory, mm. which I personally had uh, 114-111 at Corte, I think, at the time. And obviously, inexplicably, he threw away the, the Trinidad fight. Um, no, officially, did. I think I had, when I watched it a couple of times, I think I had a draw. And then, obviously, um, he said to go into the, the Mosley fight. And uh, we all know what happened. Basically, well, I don't know if you want to speak about the scorecards just now. I maybe leave it towards the end. But um, in that fight, I had uh, I did have most of winning it. Yeah, um, just opening it up to the guys. I suppose, like Andy says, Delahoya was really trying to exercise the ghosts of the Felix Trinidad fight coming into this one. And I mean, there's no mistaking really that Delahoya was the big box office attraction. They were both big punchers, but Delahoya had obviously knocked out guys at a higher level, and he was. The big superstar, whereas Mosley, despite having an aesthetically pleasing record, was um, he was the B side in this one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, as you said yourself, I mean, Mosley was you know he was regarded as an exceptional lightweight champion. I mean, he was IBF lightweight champion from ninety seven to ninety nine, I believe. You know, first beating uh, Philip Holiday for the title, and you know he was regarded as an exceptional lightweight. And you know he's known for his blistering hand speed, combination punching, body punching. He had this like smooth, con- uh, confident box style, nice swagger about him. And uh, within within boxing circles, everyone knew how good Mosley was, but if the mainstream didn't know uh, how good he was, and everyone knows who, who Oscar De La Hoya is, of course. Um, going into the fight, uh, Mosley had two fights at welterweight. Uh, I believe before prior to fighting Oscar, he had you know kind of like a meaningless bout against Willie Wise, but. As Andy mentioned there, his first fight at welterweight was against Wilfredo Rivera. Now, he did knock Rivera out in the 10th round, and he showed that he did have punching power up at 147. But he did get tagged himself during that bout, which was a bit worrying going into the Oscar de la Hoya fight. So, you know, and I think that that, that standard as well in the bookies, because Mosley was like a 2-1 to one under, underdog, I believe. So, you know, all the pressure was on de la Hoya, and I don't think many people thought Mosley would you know, make the transition to an elite welterweight. So quickly, um, De La Hoya was defending his WBC welterweight title. Um, he had beaten Darrell Coley in an eliminator. However, Trinidad, who was a WBC champion, relinquished the title to move up to fight David Reed for the WBA light middleweight title. So, um, you know, Oscar was a defending champion. He was definitely the man. He was the lineal champion by default uh, on account of Trinidad moving up. But um, as you say, you know, two East LA boys fighting in the ring. I think Oscar had lost twice to Mosley in the amateurs. So, you know, there wa- even then, there, wa- there was some inkling within people in the know that maybe Mosley might have had De La Hoya's number. But, um, you know, let's take it over the court and see what, um, you know, he has to say about it. Just, just noticing, actually, um, the sanctioning fees, um, the WBC sanctioning fees, De La Hoya had paid as much as 450000 sorry, $450,000 dollars sanction fees in previous title fights and he says he wasn't going to do it again so I think uh, Aram had to go and basically negotiate what was classified as a discount ended up paying 3% in commission fees to WBC and I think Andy as well sorry before Kurt jumps in there the Duel Coley fight that Dave mentioned uh, Oscar picked up the IBA title which was actually on the line in this Mosley fight the International Boxing Association belt I've seen that yeah, one as did. well mate did, did, that was, that was all favourite of Roy Jones Jr's member when he was light heavyweight champ <laughs> They, sp- they sprung up all over the place, the IBA. I, I, like, they actually sanctioned the um, Casamayor Corrales fight, the first fight, I believe. Obviously, that was a cracking fight, but they actually sanctioned that. I think they sanctioned... Um, I think they actually sanctioned... Uh, or one of the sanctioned bodies for the Vargas de la Hoya fight. So, you know, they, they're rare they're ugly head every now and again. <laughs> it's like Steve just mentioned. I mean, when we were discussing fights to, to have for this first ever episode, I wasn't really interested in this fight, but when Steve mentioned the IBA titles on the line, I just felt, well, it was merited. I mean, this was what made this fight all the more special, wasn't it? But anyway, I, I think mean, it's what it, it, the make that's what generated the pay per view, boys. Yeah, I mean, once this title's on the line, people just tune in. They just want to see that strap, and the winner just, you know, they go home with, forget the legacy, they just go home with that strap. But I think, <laughs> you know, for this fight, that what makes it so great is you've got a guy moving up in weight. I know he had you know two fights there, but he's he's going in with you know a top top name here. There's there's no bullshitting around, and I think with both Shane and Oscar, I mean if you look at their records, forget the forget the losses, just look at who they fought. I mean they fought absolutely everyone between them, and two guys who you know win or lose, they wanted to fight the best consistently, and I just think that's what makes it so special. Two guys who knew each other, who were friends. 
would obviously go on to you know form a, a long-lasting friendship. They've known each other God knows how many years now, and I just think to do, to do it in LA as well. They they just wanted to. They didn't just want to make the fight. They wanted to put on a fight, and I think from the first round, the first round was a, a great start. And you know, going in the the twelfth round is one of the best. I mean, two guys who are both tired, and they just both wanted to win so much. And you know, Oscar was was the biggest name in boxing and I think Mosley was was the guy that like you said he was a champion he was a, a fantastic lightweight but he just needed that that big name to not really become a, a mega star but because I don't think he, he did really even after this win but no. to get the the recognition and the respect from everyone and you know I think a lot of people including Oscar thought that you know he's because he was been at welterweight for a few years and he he was the size of him and I felt that he thought he could you know really push Mosley back and you know walk through him kind of and, and Mosley showed just I mean we all know now you know his legendary chin and how tough he is but at the time maybe they thought Oscar could really get to him and really put the hurting on him and as we talk about the fight in a minute I mean an absolute great fight and it's it's one of those mm -hmm. big fights that really did you know pass the test because so many times we we get these big fights that they're just a tactical bouts and a lot of people aren't happy with them but these two really put it on. I think it's a great fight uh, that, to discuss. I was just going on uh, Kurt's point there. I, I, he's completely right. Even though it was Mosley's coming out party as such, he didn't really make the transition from, you know, he, he didn't he didn't make that leap to mainstream star, did he? I mean, Bob Arum had a kind of a cute line about that. He said that uh, after beating De La Hoya, um, Mosley had the, king, the keys to the kingdom, but he forgot to open the door. And that's pretty much the case, isn't it? I mean, he, he, he fought, he fought Adrian, Sto yeah, he fought Adrian Stone, didn't he? Do you remember Adrian Stone? Yeah, and, uh, Sean Taylor for, but Philip Holden. Fought Shannon Taylor. Yeah. But what, that's yeah, the fought, thing. I think people that should be a reminder to people because if you see them today, I mean, I know I'm just going off topic slightly, but people say, you know, fighters passing the torch, like you know Vladimir Klitschko losing to Fury, or Terence Crawford fighting Pacquiao passing the torch, as if it's a God-given right that he should beat the mega star. But that's the biggest proof. He beat the biggest guy in the sport, and his next fight was fighting in the theatre in Madison Square Garden. I mean, that just tells you everything. And Mosley had everything. Mosley was a fantastic fighter, a puncher, fast. But sometimes, you know, just beating someone big doesn't automatically give you the right. You got to, it's, it all got to work together. And for Mosley, it was a, a sad case. It didn't really, and you know, he deserved a lot bigger. But like I said, years later, he's got the, you know, the recognition of everyone really. So my right in saying, I think Dave mentioned this, Mosley made the jump right up from lightweight to welterweight, is that correct? Well, he, fought, he, had, he had to, he had, yeah, that's right, he, he, made the, he made the leap from lightweight to welterweight. Now, in fairness, I do believe he was struggling to make the lightweight limit towards the end of his career, but there was a lot of commercial sense moving to welterweight to chase the, the, big, the big dog in Oscar Pelaya. Oh, yeah. There was talks at the time of Mosley fighting uh, Mayweather at lightweight. I don't know how close they were to, come, to actually fighting, but around that period, you know, 99, early 2000, you know, there was, I think it was more 99, uh, there was talks of uh, Mosley fighting Mayweather, but I think Mosley had his, you know, his sights set on uh, De La Hoya, and, you know, he, he did have two fights at Welterweight prior to fighting um, De La Hoya. And it, it's kind of funny how it works out as well, because years later, us could be in the same situation where a man called Manny Pacquiao would jump from lightweight to face him at, mm -hmm. technically it was welterweight, but, you know, he's a bit under, but... Mm. Did the same kind of thing, jump up and face her, obviously a much faded Oscar, but yeah, it just, you know, for Mosley to do it, I mean, people talk about weight division so much now, and, you know, we were going to see Cal Brook going up there against Golovkin, but, you know, these, you know, weight divisions it's exist it. for a reason, and you've got to give a guy, you know, a lot of respect for going in there, I mean, I know Oscar started low himself, but, you know, he was a proper welterweight, and he'd been there for about seven or eight fights, I believe, by the time Mosley came around. Yeah, as we did say, I hey. mean, his, his first fight at, at the weight after being at lightweight was with Fedor uh, Rivera. As I say, I was just checking back there. Um, Penal Whitaker, the first fight in San Martin, I think it was, um, you know, many, including Harold Leatherman, had uh, Rivera winning that fight. Uh, Whitaker, I did think, won the rematch pretty comfortably, but then a few years later, obviously, Oscar stops him in eight, and then Mosley stops him about a year later in, in, uh, in ten rounds. Sorry, Dave. Oh, no, I was just saying... Um I was talking about the Rivera fight there. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but he did knock Rivera clean out. Um, Rivera was counted out, but as I said earlier, in that fight, uh, Mosley didn't really show the same elusiveness he did at lightweight. So you know, there, there, there was like yeah. a kind of question mark going into well, the going into the delay fight. A thing that I'd like to like do with this show as well is like if if this fight, you know, it's hard, but if this fight was taking place this Saturday, how how do you think you would look at it and how, who would you have as favourite for the fight? 
going into that fight, the first fight, I would, you would probably need to go with Oscar. I would yeah, really definitely. think that. I think yeah. everyone would need to go with Oscar. Yeah, I, I, I would I, I would go with Oscar as well. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I was just going to say, um, looking at the date, I, I still can't believe it's 16 years ago. I mean, th that's the first thing that jumps out to me, how time flies. And it was actually nice to reminisce, Kurt, watching it on YouTube. It just brought back so many memories. I mean, it was great to see Michael Buffer back on top form. You really forget just how good he was compared to what he is now. And, <laughs> and, and, and Oscar coming into a, a ballad that he performed himself. And also, one yeah. other thing that stuck out to me, one of the judges was, was actually a Mr. Pat Russell, obviously famous for the uh, Vargas Bradley fuck-up recently. Uh, so, it's all these faces are jumping yeah. out at you. It was good seeing Buffer not introducing the Sean Mousley, wasn't it, or something like that as well. No, uh, like I think it was the um, I think it was the first fight at Staples Centre as well. Could be wrong in there, but I'm pretty sure yeah, it was. It was, was a perfect fight as well. Perfect fight, Absolutely. Like, really. Well, I think, I think it was the time as well because I think most of the fights or the the main fights were going to New York at the time, and, and then Vegas got involved. Because um, I say I was reading about a bit about tax stuff, and that I noticed that. Uh, in some places, especially, I think it was it Bob Arm took a fight to Vegas. Uh, what one was it? Jorge Paez against Tony Lopez. Uh, uh, basically, uh, no, it wasn't that. So it was Oscar against uh, against Trinidad. It made a gate just under thirty million, of course, because of the tax. I think it was four percent tax at the gate. It was just over half a million dollars had to pay in tax for that. So I can do the money at the end of the day to try and get the fight, as you said, yeah. to get it into the get it in the Staples Center for the first fight. And that. By the way, is Oscar statue though outside the Staples Center? Was that the Honda Centre? Yeah, it's outside Staples, isn't it? Yeah, it's outside uh, Yeah, I'm not surprised that his, his statues ended up out there because he was... He's an iconic figure, isn't he, Oscar? Right back to the Olympics in 92, all the way throughout his career. He, he's just been that iconic guy. I mean... I suppose oh, yeah. we can we can sort of shuffle into the fight itself. I mean, I have, I have so many notes about the fight because there's so much going on before, there's so much going on after, but the fight itself, as Kurt said before, it's just whenever you see the guys at their prime, at their peak, just fighting each other, same with Barrera and Morales around that time as well. Great fighters just make great fights. I mean, it's not rocket science at the end of the day. You know, if we see the prime guys go together, then they make good fights, usually. Yeah, we saw it last Saturday, didn't we? We saw it last Saturday <laughs> with... Um... You know, Santa Cruz and Frampton, and it's it's exactly like this fight as well in the sense that it is there's loads of action in this fight, but it's just high quality action for twelve rounds, and that's what was almost great about this fight. And you know, the year you know 2016 has been you know pretty dire, all things considered, but the year 2000, Jesus Christ, there were some great fights that year. Obviously, we had Morales Pereira, we had obviously we're, we're talking about another De La Hoya Mosley, um, Trinidad Vargas, at the end of the year, one of the most brutal fights you'll ever see. Mm -hmm. um, even domestically, I think we had Billy Schwar, Colin Dunn that year. You know, from a domestic point of view, you know, one of the best fights you'll ever see. I think we may have had when Rigby, Michael Ayers that year as well. I'm not too Great sure fight. about that, but Great fight, yeah, yeah. Around, it was around that time period. And he, he, even the heavyweights, I'm not sure if you remember, uh, lads, uh, Clifford Etienne against Lawrence Kleber is on, is on the Lewis <laughs> 200 okay, card. Oh, right. two, 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 two substandard heavyweights. Let's not, let's not be <laughs> around the bush. But very, very exciting action. If you haven't checked that one out, uh, do it. It's, uh, it's, it's actually a, you know, it's a good old uh, fashion slobber knocker uh, to quote uh, Jim Ross. Now, this one wasn't really a slobber knock, a slobber knocker, excuse me, if I can get the words out, because they sort of neutralised each other early on. I noticed the way Delahoya tried to get his trademark jab, the left hook going off the jab, but. In this one, Mosley's strategy was very interesting. He started out very fast, very aggressively, and then that caused Oscar, I thought, to struggle a little bit early on in the rounds. Oh, yeah. You know, with Robert Alcazar, Dave, throughout the contest, it, Robert Alcazar was getting more concerned, you know, that Oscar just wasn't closing the distance effectively enough. And Mosley comes out, pounding away with a straight right hand. Good right hand by Mosley. Slinging it over the top. Hello, you're trying to get the jab going. Well, early on, yeah. Or, or, okay, the first round, obviously, Mosley, with clear round for Mosley. I mean, his hand sure. speed, silky style, just troubled Oscar. And, yeah. you know, the jab as well. Jab was a, a big factor for Mosley, especially in the first round. I would rest for Shane. But, you know, it, early on, it, it looked like trouble for Oscar. But I thought from the second round onwards, up until, you know, maybe around five, round six, Oscar closed the gap and he asserted himself. And, you know, there were some, you know, Mo Mosley caused some puzzles. I mean, he, he did a lot of uh, quick switch hitting. You know, he switched lefty very quickly, won't switch back to righty straight away. Just to kind of show Oscar off a bit. But he started, he started to neglect the jab a lot, I thought, Mosley. 
and he started trading a lot more. And I thought, particularly in the early rounds, I thought Oscar was getting the better of the exchanges. And you know, from round four, round, round four onward, round four, um, round three, round four, I thought Mosey he was kind of having the look of a man who was, you know, he feeling the power of a full fledged elite welterweight, and he had kind of a weary look about him. Now the jab is starting to come from Oscar. Good jab. You can almost see Oscar's Another good jab. rising as the fight goes on. Even though Mosley's landing and landing a lot, Oscar seems to feel more and more secure about what he can do. When he's using his left jab, he's in control. So, I thought Oscar, I thought Oscar pretty much dominated the first half of the contest, leaving aside the first round. Um, the six, uh, the, the round six was close. I give that to Mosley um, because I thought he was catching a lot of Oscar's combinations on the arms, and Mosley was catch was um, landing some uh, eye catching shots. But um, the first half of the fight, I thought, belonged to Oscar, generally speaking. I don't know what the other guys think. That's really interesting. Yeah, guys, jump in there because, I mean, I, I didn't really exactly see it that way, which is really interesting. Well, after after four rounds, I had that level. And then I think for the next uh, three rounds, I think I gave Molly Oscar. Uh, but then, as usually what happens in Oscar fights, you know, he sometimes then they gets the, they get the jab, he doesn't throw many punches. The, the gas tank again gets called into question. And I just think, you know, as the fight wore on from about the eighth right through, I don't think I gave Oscar another round. Um, it was, as I say, it was just, it was, I suppose after seven, you could say Oscar had a slight edge in the cars, but then I just kind of felt Oscar just was early doors looking to maybe try and just set his natural size difference on, on Mosley, uh -huh. but just the speed difference in the end just basically told. Um, just try to look through my notes just now, actually, just saying that uh, Mosley basically confused Delahoy in the eighth by switching to a left hand stance and just basically counterpunched him. Um, so I just think, again, that Oscar just Apparently as well, um, he needed cortisone injections in his right hand. They obviously are not going to be looking for excuses as prime for prime, but you know that that story was put out there as well uh, you know, after the fight that he did need uh, injections in his right hand. And I have seen. I don't know if anybody's seen uh, the way that Oscar used to used to basically wrap his hands. Actually, I would I would say they were probably borderline illegal. I think with this fight, I mean. I think that's the whole fight. I think Mosley won comfortably. I, I don't think there's any dispute. But I think for the first four or five rounds, I think it was pretty even myself. I just think I like what Mosley did. I mean, him and his dad, they come up with a plan. I think straight away, get the respect of De La Hoya. And he came out like lightning. He was like, you know, throwing the left hook, really digging in hard shots. And as if to say to like the bigger man, you know, I'm not just some lightweight in here. You know, I can punch, I'm fast, and you're not just going to ball, bulldoze over me. And I think. The problem with Oscar was he, he got into the habit of following Shane around the ring. He wasn't cutting off the ring. He wasn't really. He, he stopped jabbing as well, which is I think quite a common theme in a lot of Oscar's losses. But he started just following him around the ring, and as he was following him, as is typical with a lot of boxers, we get into that habit of just following the guy around the ring. They're, they're not punching. They're just walking around, following the guy. And because Shane had the hand speed difference, he could pick him off. He could beat him to the punch, and it was just. It seemed to me he was getting more confident. Like as I said, after the first four or five rounds, Oscar was in it, but I think he started to fade and he neglected the jab. And I just think he was getting beaten to the punch. And I don't know if he was a bit wary of letting his hands go at times because he was, he, you know, Miles he was hurting him. I mean, he, both guys showed you know great chins as they did throughout their careers. They could you know take a lot of punishment. And I just think Miles was getting more confident. I think the last five rounds, I think he, he pretty much swept him and he was getting more confident as it went on and. Oscar didn't really have an answer to it, and I think he, he rectified that to a, a, you know, a large degree in the rematch. But I think going to someone like Shane Mosley was just, you know, he was playing right into Mosley's hand, especially a prime Mosley who was, you know, a guy who was unbeat and who was just used to winning all the time. Yeah, and a guy who, you know, I was never going to be just ball rushed and knocked out because, you know, he'd, he'd never, he's never been down, you know, he's never really been hurt up to that point in amateur pro sparring you know his chin's phenomenal well obviously wasn't into the Vernon Forrest fight that I think he he changed slightly as a fighter but yeah you know, I just think Oscar was spending too much time not doing anything and just following him around you know looking for that big shot but was tentative to throw it and I think Shane Marzi put on performance of his career up to that point yeah I agree yeah, I with you Kurt there I, I think that 
uh, the problem was pretty much is what you say. A lot of De La Hoya's work was always as a counter or as an answer to Mosley's sort of initial initiation. Oscar was always looking to respond when it, he wasn't able to get the left hook off either, which was a problem because Mosley's right hand was working so well for him in the last few rounds. I thought he was throwing it with such ferocity and such speed that Oscar was having to think twice every time about throwing his left yeah. hook, which was his money punch. Yeah. I'm, Nine and ten, he was very, very quick with the with the right hand counter. Yeah, I thought from the eight round onwards, Mosey was making Oscar look quite cumbersome. To be honest with you, I think as well there was a lot of body shots early on in the fight. And I think from around eight again, I think they started to take their toll on Oscar. And you see, there was a, like there was a weary look about De La Hoya. He looked tired. Or oh, the ninth round was a fantastic round. I thought Mosey won it, but there was some good action in you know, there. But again. It was kind of like a somewhat of a last hurrah for De La Hoya because I give Mosey the last three rounds. No, Mosey, Mosey looked a little tired himself. I mean, tenth round, a half up, men looked a little tired, but there was there was definitely a a, a jaded look about De La Hoya, wasn't there, in those last few rounds? And I thought he was looking a bit arm weary, and Mosey didn't really have to do much. He was kind of, especially eleven rounds, a perfect example. Mosey was kind of pot shotting. Well, he was stealing the round. He was doing enough to win the round because De La Hoya just wasn't working enough. And the, t- the last round, the twelfth round, Mosley was just was so close to putting Oscar over. It was a massive right hand. Now he took Oscar's head clean off his shoulders. But Shane actually punched himself out, so he couldn't really follow up on it. But, um, no, definitely, uh, from my point of view, Mosley was a clear winner in that one. It, I, I have a theory, though, and just when I get your take, a guy's taken. I know I mentioned the body shots taken or told on Oscar De La Hoya. But going into that fight, you know, De La Hoya had an amazing run of uh, a fight. He had, you know, Andy mentioned earlier on, he fought Ike Quarty in February 1999. Then he fought up a car who was you know, a very tricky customer. Fought Trinidad that same calendar year. Had the eliminator against uh, 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 Coley, but who's, you know, he's little known. But still, such a hard run of fights going into this one. Did, do you think that may have taken something out of that, Oya? Um, I would agree with that, mate. I mean, if you think about it, you know, when he went to welterweight and just look at who he fought, I mean, even if you go back, I think his first fight at welterweight was David Camus, then he fought, I mean, he just came out, no, sorry, it was uh, Whitaker. His first fight at uh, welterweight yeah, was Whitaker, yeah. and, you know, okay, Whitaker was probably on the, it would be on the, on the downcline by that point, I think he was also using cocaine by that point as well, but okay. Camacho, Okay, the two for uh, the, the, the rematch with Chavez, which was really slightly more competitive. Rivera, um, you just don't know. As well. maybe, the, maybe the weight. I mean, you, you know, Oscar, you know, is a good-looking guy and stuff. Like that. You know, he'd be well in about the women and the drink and stuff. You just wonder if, it, if maybe his lifestyle was maybe hampering him to make weight at that point as well. Absolutely. I mean, you mentioned I mean, you mentioned Chavez there as well. I mean, he made the rematch a lot harder than it needed to be, didn't he? I think yep. he wanted to prove a point in that one because I think Chavez is going to make some comments about. Yeah, Mexican, Mexican or whatever. That as well, because I think there'd be a bit of bad blood there. Because I think uh, after the first fight, that, that was it. Was did, was it the first fight that, that Chavez quit in, or was it the rematch? Because I think he claimed. No, uh, yeah, the first fight he he was stopped on cuts, but Chavez. That's the one. That's the one. The first, yeah, the first fight. The first fight. He, he claimed that his son, uh, that Julio's toy or something like. That, he threw at him uh, and it hit him in the eye and it cut him. That was the reason <laughs> yeah. why. That was the excuse he used. Honestly, that, that's a Courtney Oscar in his book. Actually, that was the excuse he used. And he, he he said as well that um, Oscar didn't fight like some, like a Mexican. He fought yeah. like a pussy. Uh, he was, you know, all these disparaging comments, and that really irked Oscar. And you could see in the rematch. I mean, he just wanted to prove a point, and he, oh. uh, he fought, fought kind of uh, Chavez uh, mano a mano, as as they say. I, th- I think the problem with Oscar though was that at that time. I mean, he was seen as a guy who was basically feasting on. Guys who, at, at, at their best, would have been very, very tough for him. And he was like, I mean, he, he did nothing wrong. He had big fights, but someone like Panel Whitaker, who was was a coked up and a guy who I felt really pushed him close, and the scorecards I thought were a joke in that fight. But you know, someone like Panel Whitaker, who you know there were a lot of cries of robbery. Then you know, Chavez, obviously a Mexican legend. I mean, when a guy's getting you know 
going against with Chavez and you know using him as a kind of you know I'm going to beat you up as a name to to you know hit, elevate myself even more. I think a lot of fans didn't like that. The Quarto fight, that's, I think that's when he started getting more respect because I mean personally I thought he, he dropped just lost. that fight. Yeah, I thought he, he dropped, just, got up, yep. Yeah, he, he started getting the respect. I felt he, he just lost that fight, but it's a close fight, and Corte was obviously a really good fight as well. And then obviously the Trinidad fight, he was, he was getting criticism for that because even though he boxed absolutely brilliant for the first six or seven rounds, you know he was seen as running for the last. Which you know yeah. I think he's even admitting himself he did himself. You know for the last three rounds he gave he gave Trinidad you know a chance because obviously he thought he was so ahead and the trainer told him you know he said he told him but. You know, in this the Mosley fight, I think he was still struggling for a long time. Even though he's a, the biggest star in boxing, he's still struggling with the criticism. You know, especially on Mexican fans as well. And I just think it just wasn't deserved because you know, like I said earlier, you know, him and Shane, they just fought absolutely everyone. And I tell you what, if all the big stars and big names fought you not know, like them, win or lose, boxing would be would be booming all the time because you wouldn't have none of this bullshit about negotiations for five years for a fight and all this just get in the ring and fight and you know if you're good enough you're going to be back in another big fight and like these guys were and I just think it's a testament to both of them and we need to see more from you know the big stars because someone like Oscar he could he could fight absolutely anyone and they'd sell paid view and he'd make money but you know he wanted to, to I think it was a kind of a he was hurt by the criticism and he, he wanted to fight the best, he wanted to prove himself to be the best and that he had to fight the top names and you know, look at his career, I mean, you, you can't knock him at all. And that's a good, that's a great point you made, Kurt. I think Del Ohio definitely was stung by the criticism for the latter half of the Trinidad fight. I think Michael Katz, the um, boxing writer for the New York Times, he labelled Oscar uh, Chicken Del Ohio and that really annoyed Oscar, like it really irked him because, you know, Katz is a prominent uh, boxing journalist, he would have been like the no, he had to say it to Dan Ray for his day, but um, you know he he put that out there and def and that kind of criticism definitely stung Oscar. And I think that definitely played into maybe him being a little more cavalier and not having the great a great game plan because I don't think he really had a great game plan for uh, this fight against Mosey. As Andy mentioned earlier on, I think um, so he was so. So he was so wrapped up in the size and he wasn't he? he thought he could just overwhelm Mosley. Yep. And you know, you could argue earlier on that's what he was doing, but you know, at, at that level you need you, you need to have more than just uh, that 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 type of a mindset, you know, at, at that and that's real high class at level elite boxing. And you need to be able to adapt, you need to have several game plans going into the fight. And, you know, Oscar I think um was found wanted in the second half of the fight and you know, Mosley found the answers. I think George Foreman actually addressed that issue, what you were saying, all those things really, guys. He said at the end of the fight that despite his golden boy image and the way some people still perceived him as a nice boxer, he doesn't like getting hit. George said Oscar fought like a warrior and put it all on the line in a, a, a last round exchange in skill for Will. And I think that's a good assessment of it, to be honest with you. He did sort of snipe back at the critics. And for, for all of his faults, Oscar, he, was, he had steel behind the pretty boy image, didn't he? He wasn't, he wasn't just lightweight guy. Oh, he had, oh, I, I think he had his nose burst up in that first fight, did he not? Um, you know, I, I'm, you know, as you were saying, there was a lot of comments, as, as Dave, Dave was saying as well, about going into the, going into the first fight, they were saying, as, uh, well, sorry, after trying that fight, he ran. You know, it was basically, a, the same question was put towards Sugar Ray Leonard, being the golden boy of his generation, quite good looking and stuff. You know, has he got the minerals to stand in there and take a beating, or take a, you know, just basically take a trimming, you know, make it a fight? You know, Oscar did. Oscar proved. You know, at times during that fight, he was willing to stand in there and trade. You know, the cuts prove it. You know, over the course of the two fights, um, I know after the after the fight and stuff, he was he was pretty pissed off, and you know, he was talking about uh, retirement. I think Bob Arm even mm -hmm. even mentioned about the potential uh, retirement and stuff. And you can understand. I mean, over a course of a nine nine month period, Oscar's lost two razor close decisions. You know. You can argue either way that, he's, that he deserved to lose both decisions, but uh, you can understand his, his mindset. He's, he's maybe wanting to quit because you know I'm just never going to get going to get the victory. Money as well. Yeah. At that point. I, I just yep. think I, you know, I, St Steve mentioned George Foreman there. One thing I didn't like was the, the Oscar De La Hoya cheerleading by Hayden. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, oh yeah. It started off. I mean, I don't get me wrong. I, I'm a big fan of George Foreman, but and I, I like it in commentary, but I think you've got to try and remain biased, and I, I just think they weren't giving Shane the credit. They were saying, you know, 
basically straight away they were saying it was Oscar's fight and you know Shane had hit Oscar and he couldn't really hurt him but you know they never mentioned that well the white weight he's hitting the light former lightweight and he's not hurting him either but there was no <coughs> credit until the end then they started giving him credit and even in the rematch I think it, the narrative was set already that this is mm-hmm. Oscar's fight we're gonna push it and you know I, I mean before the the first bow the first comment from Lampy is uh, Shane Miles looks dry he hasn't warmed up properly He's gonna, That's right. You know, it's going to be it's going to be a bit of a struggle for him. He's going to have to really work hard now to get. I just think you know you don't need to do it. Just just call the fight as it is, and you know no one's knocking Oscar, you know. But just just call it how it is, and I think you know you have to watch that fight. And Shane ran away with it, in my opinion, in the end. And you know it was only the last few rounds they started giving him more credit and. You know, I, th- I think maybe you know he—that's what he had to fight the guys he fought because he didn't. I mean, even after beating De La Hoya, like I said, he was in the theatre in his next fight. He must have felt, well, what what do I have to do to to get the the credit and basically the the big name appeal that I deserve? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to look at the uh, rematch in our next episode, but uh, you definitely, Kirk, there was definitely. Um... Uh, a, a, a preconceived narrative wasn't there on the commentary position. I mean, Lampley was almost Lampley. sarcastic mm. for for for, for De La Hoya in in the rematch. Um, I don't think I've heard the HBO commentary for this fight, but I imagine it's pretty much the same. Right. Yeah, there, yeah, there was, de- there, was de- there was definitely um, definitely a HBO bias towards Oscar, which is frustrating. You know, I mean, we we see it, a lot of that ourselves over here with you know Matchroom Sky, and you know it is grating. You know, it's just call the fight as you see it, as you said. It's, it's, it's hard to it's hard to if you're a fan who wants to you know is interested in scoring the fight and seeing how you get it i think as as try as you can it's hard to when you're constantly hearing three people tell you oh he's hurting him he's out jabbing him he's landing 30 jabs to you know 10 jabs this is oscar's fight it's it's hard even if you try as you might and sometimes people might go the opposite way and think well i'm going to score it for the other guy because i'm sick of these guys just constantly telling me what i'm not seeing was it the rematch where where uh, Lampley just basically hung on to, you know, the compu box stats for like yeah. four or five Ev- rounds? Every round at the beginning of every basically, round. What he does, who, he was, it was, it was Manny Stewart. Stewart he was arguing with. That's who it was. He was arguing with Manny Stewart. It was because it was pure, I think it was purely because that you know, was it Mosley Landon the kind of more you know more kind of flashier combos? But we'll discuss that anyway. It's okay. Well, I just just going back to the first fight as well. I mean, I know Andy you mentioned there. Uh, you know, Oscar did. Talk about retirement. I I did think that there, there was you know there was a little bit of sour grapes in Del Hoya, and I'm a huge Oscar Del Hoya fan, but I I don't think he took that defeat with the uh, with a lot of grace. Would you agree? No, he he didn't. And the thing is, with with his like with the Trinidad fight, I can understand it. You know, because it felt like his fight. Even if he, I've I've looked at it and I I had it a draw, but I can see why. I mean, Oscar should you know deserve to win the fight. He fought better than Trinidad that night. But in round by round scoring, I think you've got to try and be consistent and just go by that. And boxing's a funny thing where a guy can win six clear rounds, and the other guy might win six rounds that are close that you've given him, and it's a draw. But it doesn't seem right because the guy seems like he deserves it. But with that Shane Mosley first fight, I just Oscar must surely know he lost that fight. That he should have given the credit. Shane won that fight. No arguments. I don't. I don't believe anyone can see it different. Absolutely. I mean, I'm tired of saying it. I don't divert to too much off topic here, but um, you know, people say he he won. This round was a big round for him. You know, there, unless you're not the guy down or completely batter him, there's no really such thing as big rounds. You, it, it, it's a it's a scoring system. You know, it's ten nine. If you win the round, if you steal the round in the last twenty seconds, you're still going to get ten nine. You know, that's, yeah. you know, you can argue about having kind of a a revamped scoring system or what have you like, but that is the scoring system that we adhere to, and you know, round by round scoring. You know, I. You, you, sometimes when you leave a side round by round scoring, you can get a kind of a different uh, overall impression of a fight. But when you score fights, sometimes round by round, you, you you kind of get another impression as to, as to say, okay, it's a little bit closer than you know I first thought. Guys, I've, I've made a few notes, actually very, very brief notes before we just close this out. Now, I thought it might be interesting for the listeners, particularly ones who maybe weren't around at the time or maybe old enough to remember the fight, just a, a very quick look at some of the future rivals of these guys, where they were when t- the fight took place, names which have featured heavily within the careers of De La Hoya and Mosley. And on the 17th of June, 2000, uh, Manny Pacquiao actually fought 11 days later on the 28th of June, 2000, knocking out a certain Sung Kon Che in the Philippines. And it would it would actually be almost a year to the day later in 2001 that Manny had even started his American dream under Murad Mohammed with a six round knockout of Lelo Ledwaba. Uh, as for 
yeah, as for Floyd Mayweather, he'd only had two fights in 2000, and uh, he appointed Gregorio Vargas in a WBC super featherweight title defence, and he went on to stop Emmanuel Augustus later on in that year. And uh, Ricardo Mayorga, obviously a name, uh, a guy who was knocked out by both men at various stages of their career, he was fresh off a knockout win in early June 2000, just a couple of weeks before this fight took place, over Elio Ortiz in a Costa Rican hotel. So um, just <laughs> before we move on to the scorecards, I thought I'd just throw that in. Because yeah, it was... It's, 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 bring side for that one. Some, some names you mentioned there, um, Steve. I'm not sure, you know, I mean, Goyo Vargas. I mean, I remember him back in the day beating Paul Hodgkinson. And he was, that was actually in Dublin, that fight. But uh, if you read the reports after the fight uh, with Hodgkinson, people are making out Vargas was the next to run. You know, it's just, and the next to you know, it's crazy. Well, Canelo Alvarez was actually 10 years old when this fight took place, and he turned professional five years later, aged 15 in 2005. Just... Ah, and he fought mostly like 10 years later. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this, is, this is making me uh, feel so old, this podcast here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the scorecards then, guys. Um, if you've got them up in front of you, Andy, just read them out before we close off the first edition of Punch I was, Pass. I was going to leave that to Michael to, to read it, but I dare, I dare say we'll, we'll get that idea then. But Lou Filippo had it 116-112. Mosley, Pat Russell, 115-113 for Mosley. And uh, Marty Salmon had it 115-113 for De La Hoya. Myself, personally, had it 115-113 for Mosley. Yep, I had it the same as well. It, uh, I had it at 116-112. Um, I was speaking off fair to the guys initially. I had it one one five one one three to Mosley, but I'm just trying to remember what round I've differed on this time. I think it was a six round. I think initially I gave that to Oscar, and this time I gave it to Mosley. Harold Lutterman had to score it. Okay, Jim, one sixteen, one twelve, eight rounds to four. Sugar Shane Mosley. Jim, after round six, I mean Shane Mosley's hand speed just had Oscar De Loya baffled. He'd walk forward, hands apart. Mosley would stick that left jab in his face. Shane Mosley was the quicker guy. At the end, De La Hoya was battered and bruised. If Shane Mosley don't win his title, give Oscar De La Hoya's career to AJ Benzer. Yeah, I had it 116-112. Um, and, you know, if you speak about old and when this fight took place, the greatest heavyweight of all time, Audley Harrison, was winning gold in Sydney and making the dreams for a lot of people come true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's anywhere else we can go with that, guys. I think we'll close it off. Um, thanks for me, Steve, and from Andy and Dave Lee and Mr. Kurt Ward as well for jumping on. And we'd like to thank everyone for listening to Punches from the Past. First edition, Oscar De La Hoya versus Shane Mosley. And we'll be back very soon with another episode. Thanks for listening, guys.